Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is December 28, 2022. In this video, which we're actually doing live with the Twitch chat at twitch.tv slash socialism S4A, is we want to finish up from live stream number 73, our last live stream, the 40 ways to fight fascism. Uh, we got up to number 24 last time. And I wanted to finish that before we get into the rest of the stream that we have sat down to do because the stream is going to be all about COVID and basically I have an entire window in my browser of COVID related articles, just dozens and dozens of them. And to finish out the year, I collected all those together and we're going to just do several days of COVID year end wrap up. But before we get to that, I want to um, close out the Antifa stuff. So this is going to be in a separate video from the rest of the stream. And before we get started, I just want to say thanks to the patrons, patreon.com slash socialism for all. These fine folks signed up for $2 a month or more. And that support is both encouraging and materially helpful. So uh, if you like this show, thank a patron and consider becoming one. Also, engagement helps like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. That helps YouTube to recommend this content to more people. All right, so with that out of the way, let us finish up with the 40 Ways to Fight Fascism by Spencer Sunshine, who is an anti-fascist activist, actually dropped into the comments on Stream 73, said that there may be an updated version of this guide coming soon. All right, so let's pick it up here with Section 4, Counter Demonstrate. Direct action gets the goods. While our tactics should evolve and adapt to the situation at hand, <clears throat> one of the most effective avenues for change has always been gathering in the streets. Large public events that are explicit about being white nationalist or fascist are extremely rare. For example, in 2017, their most successful year in decades, only three white nationalist events drew over 100 attendees. And the largest of these, the Charlottesville rally, even claimed that it wasn't white nationalist. This would be the Unite the Right rally. Counter-demonstrating within sight and sound distance of their event can potentially deny them a high-profile public platform, attract support for your anti-fascist cause, and even overshadow the far right. So we pick it up here, 25, win public opinion. Social media and press outlets have the power to sway large numbers of people, but you have to know how to use them. Use language appropriate to the audience that you want to reach. Memes, comics, videos, and short articles in everyday language can give people accessible and fun ways of engaging with the fight against the far right. 26. Push local officials to do the right thing. In areas where permits are required, pressure, pressure local governments to refuse or revoke permits to far-right rallies. Example, after Charlottesville, authorities denied a permit to the far-right No to Marxism in America rally in Berkeley. Now, side note here, Socialism for All is a Marxist channel. We lean Marxist-Leninist, but consider ourselves Marxist unity to the extent that that is a possible thing. And um, let me tell you, the Democratic Party is not Marxist. The Republican Party definitely is not Marxist. Even the Green Party, not Marxist. You may find Marxists in there, but the party is not Marxist. And so on. As far as having a rally no to Marxism in America, uh, they would uh, certainly be jumping the gun on that. We're trying to build a better left, which for my money would mean a more authentically Marxist left that can be more uh, internationalist, anti-chauvinist, anti-fascist in a really effective and not skin-deep liberal way, and so on. Uh, but yeah, no to Marxism in America. Uh, I think that's pretty much our, already where we are. Anyway, continuing. It was only after pressure was applied that authorities even bothered to learn that the application was incomplete and should never have been granted. 27. Organize counter demonstrations. If fascists are holding a public demonstration, you should be in the streets too. But when organizing a counter demonstration, remember that the far right will likely try to dox the organizers, attendees, and supporters. So take precautions. For example, the guest list for Facebook event pages should be set so that attendees aren't visible. 
Large demonstrations are a lot of work, and they require many things that don't involve going to the street. This can include finding a planning space, getting permits and equipment, drumming up excitement, or what we might call promo work, hype, fundraising, which can be done both before and after, arranging transportation and housing for out-of-towners, setting up legal and communication support, and recruiting street medics. 28. Pressure local business and rental spaces. If there's going to be a far-right event, encourage local businesses to refuse service to those who are attending. Circulate pictures of known members as well as symbols they might be sporting. Warn local hotels, restaurants, and bars. Be sure to offer support to businesses that choose to refuse fascists' money. <clears throat> See number seven for more about that. 29. Document their rallies. High-quality video and photography of those who attend far-right events allows people to research individuals later and to document any, any criminal acts they engage in. But be warned that getting clear images of faces is a lot harder than it seems. Years after Charlottesville, those who attended are still being identified, sometimes from grainy or obscured images. 30. Don't be outgunned. <clears throat> if it's legal in your area and consistent with your beliefs, consider coming to the demonstration with firearms. If the far right will be armed, there's an important psychological dimension to your side also bringing weapons. But this should be done in a group. Make sure that all members scrupulously observe the law. It's a skill to carry firearms in public, so train beforehand. Coming armed can be a contentious tactic, so be sure to communicate your intentions to other counter demonstration organizers ahead of time so that you can work out any potential problems. 31. Call out fascists and call in colleagues. In the big picture, everyone who opposes fascism is on the same side. While it's normal and healthy to debate and disagree, publicly dragging each other helps the far right. So comment here. I remember one time, and this was not in meat space, this was uh, in social media. I remembered that I was with another communist um, basically getting into an argument with a fascist. And it was the kind of thing where we were, you know, a lot of times it's not worth um, spending time on a fascist. This person had a little bit of a platform and we felt that it was kind of worth it to get into a bit more of an argument with this person to extend the discussion and basically just have some practice getting them on record, staying, saying stupid shit. In other words, shaking the tree and seeing what falls out of it, what kind of talking points were they going to spit out? And um, this person I actually got into kind of a spat with. I was messaging them in real time during this going like, hey, stop attacking me. They were doing this kind of weird um, nitpicking my points while we were engaging with a fascist. Listen, you know, if you want to nitpick something I said, fine. That's not the time or place. While we're actively trying to present a united front, against like actively in a discussion against a fascist um, which is being done purely as a PR stunt to you know help like publicly show up a fascist and show how their talking points are fucking garbage that was the point not sort of like well I see your point and you know no no no, no. and uh, yeah anyway um, that was not the time or place so Again, publicly dragging each other does help the far right. So be mindful of how you do that. Continuing, remember that number 14, drive wedges between individuals and groups, goes both ways. The far right will often publish dirt on each other during personal or tactical disagreements. This behavior shows us their weak spots and make far right unity harder for them to achieve. So don't let them take advantage of this dynamic when it seeks to play itself out on our side. Instead of airing conflicts in public, discuss your issues directly. Get to know other activists, form coalitions, and build relationships based on mutual respect and a shared desire for a world free of fascism. But if you can't, at least try to live and let live. Disagreements are inevitable. Drama is not. So another note about that. Um, sometimes people will say, like, uh, especially prior to this year or the end of last year, um, when people would, you know, there are certain um, neo-fascists who are trying to masquerade as Marxists today. This is not just a matter of like revisionism. It's people who are actively engaged in uh, relationships with neo-fascist interests, such as Dugan or LaRouche. 
and things like that. And people would make accusations. You know, I was one of the outlets that was willing to stand up and say something about Caleb Maupin or Infracell or people like that. And there were others as well. Um, but we would get this accusation sometimes, like, you're splitting the movement. No, no, no. Certain people who are engaged in uh, attending neo-fascist conferences as speakers, as Caleb Maupin did, for example, those are fascists. You know, there's that saying, like, one Nazi and 11 people sitting around a table equals a dozen Nazis sitting around a table. You don't appear at a neo-fascist conference as a speaker with other neo-fascists basically agree with what they say and expect to come out of that somehow considering yourself anti-fascist. That's not how it works. So yeah, there's a limit to who is within the movement and who's out to destroy the movement. And yeah, but that said, um, you know, when you do have a disagreement with somebody, which I disagree with other media outlets talking about socialism sometimes, you know, you don't often really or ever see me turning it into drama necessarily. So there's, there's a way to do this and a way not to do this. All right, continuing. 29, docu... Uh, that is the same thing. All right, let's go on to the next one. 32, support people being threatened. Fascists love to threaten people. Real world support for those targeted might include escorting them or their family in public running errands for them, and guarding their homes in case of an attack. Digitally, this may include helping someone wipe their presence online, adding security tools to accounts, or investigating who's threatening them. 33. Establish a safe house. A safe house can be as simple as someone who is not known to the far right and is able to offer a place where folks can stay in an emergency. This person needs to make sure that they're available to be contacted at all times. 34. Help the families of victims. Between 2008 to 2019, the U.S. far right committed over 360 murders, meaning that thousands of people lost family members. Reach out and offer support to the loved ones of those killed. This may include raising money for funeral expenses, dealing with threats, and helping get their lives back together. 35. Aid the injured. In addition to those killed, thousands have been injured by the far right. Reach out to victims and ask how you can be supportive. They may need help with money, legal issues, errands, or just need a shoulder to cry on. If the victim wishes to go to the authorities, and this is consistent with your beliefs, offer to accompany them through the process. If they want to report a hate crime but don't want to go through law enforcement, consider organizations like PUAH, Portland United Against Hate, that tracks hate crimes without reporting to authorities. So there are options out there. 36. Support those targeted by the law. It's not uncommon for law enforcement to see the far right more favorably than their opponents. Comment why? Well, the far right is performing paramilitary and parapolice vigilante type services during times of crisis for capitalism. The police and military are already there to act in the interests of imperialism and domestic private property. And the far right is basically here for that same system, but an even more rabid form of it. So you can kind of see them as the irregulars. And the cops and military understand this. They understand that they have basically the same interests in mind. So, yeah. Continuing, therefore, those working against fascism often become entangled in the legal system. Now, but you hear Joe Biden talking about, you know, uh, we got to stop fascism. No, the Democrats are fascist collaborators. They're also an imperialist party who collaborate with the overtly more reactionary Republican Party on every major project of war and the domestic police state and on and on. That liberal, quote, anti-fascism is skin deep, shallow, because they're still for capitalism, which is the system that needs fascism when it goes into crisis. Continuing, facing charges, receiving a grand jury subpoena, and going to trial are all stressful and often expensive events. As part of building a strong community, make sure that you provide legal support for fellow activists. Very important. 37. Support imprisoned activists. 
Activists who refuse to testify before grand juries are convicted of criminal, oh, sorry, or are convicted of criminal offenses may end up in jail or prison, and this is expensive. Prisoners can easily spend thousands of dollars a year on commissary expenses, phone calls, and reading materials, and this doesn't even include legal expenses. They really gouge prisoners in that system. Families might require day-to-day -day help or financial assistance to make prison visits. Make sure that prisoners have contact with the outside world through letters, email, phone calls, and visits. In addition to fundraisers, hold letter writing events for prisoners. Comment. If I remember correctly, the Black Panther Party would, for example, organize um, bus trips to take relatives to go see their imprisoned family members. So there's an example. 38. Warn people who are threatened. Fascists are exceptionally violent, both in word and action. As you monitor them, you will inevitably discover threats against local groups and individuals. Be sure to warn those targeted about the threats while, if necessary, making sure that your sources remain confidential. 39. Publicize threats and attacks. Mere threats of violence can silence progressive political political activists by driving them off social media and limiting their public appearances, and members of historically oppressed groups, including people of color, Jews, Muslims, women, and LGBTQ plus folks, will always get unwanted attention from the far right. Make sure that you help to provide support, as doing so expands your potential coalition and weakens the efforts of the far right. Publicizing threats <clears throat> helps to neutralize them. This exposes the violence of the far right, creates sympathy for those who are targeted, and helps to drive wedges between the far right and those who are sympathetic to their worldview but recoil at violence. 40. Support communities pushing back against fascist recruitment. The far right often tries to enter existing social groups and either influence them, recruit from inside them, or take them over, a tactic called entryism. In recent years, fascists have recruited from soccer supporters clubs, on, or football as it is called in Europe, online gamers, music subcultures such as skinheads, neo-folk, black metal, and punk, and religious communities, especially heathens, Satanists, and Greek and Russian Orthodox Christians. We see that, for example, in the case of Dugan. So um, they're trying to basically... <clears throat> um, now, <clears throat> as it is... Um, religion, and especially some of the older churches, older sort of strains or, you know, branches of the uh, Christian movement, um, are already holdovers from feudal days. As such, they're largely part of feudal reaction, even relative to Christianity. I mean, a lot of the, or sorry, not to Christianity, to capitalism. I mean, a lot of the uh, capitalist activists, you know, ideologists, were atheists, you know, around the time of the Enlightenment. It was, we were going to be cleaning house, they said, um, you know, against the monarchy and the church and all this kind of stuff. And then they found that in order to anchor their capitalism against overthrow by the working class that they were creating and exploiting by running capitalism, they had to actually anchor capitalism in feudal reaction. So this stuff actually stayed around and certain alliances were formed between the ruling capitalists and the deposed feudal order. Um, but Dugan has talked, for example, about how um, the Russian Orthodox Church is like a perfect vehicle for fascist mysticism and it can be imbued with fascist messaging and so on. At the same time, you have um, slightly older videos of Dugan, like late 90s, circa 2000, engaging in um, you know, Aleister Crowley type um, rituals of uh, occultism and things like that. So they're definitely the sort of fascist underground. It's not every skinhead. It's not every neo-folk listener. It's not every black metal, you know, or punk, obviously. There's tons of very obvious left-wing punk etc. Not every neo-pagan or heathen or Satanist is a fascist, but these are communities that fascists have definitely tried to recruit from. The other thing about the soccer or the football hooligans, that's another uh, big thing. In certain areas, like, there was massive uh, far-right influence within the, um, you know, soccer culture. 
So it's something to be aware of as anybody who's active in these scenes for any number of time, uh, or, you know, for any number of years can tell you for any appreciable amount of time. Anyway, in all of these cases, anti-racist members of those targeted communities have pushed back against fascist recruitment. Since this kind of opposition is best done by existing members of these communities, since they're the ones in there and have not just a stake in, but an authoritative voice in what the values of those communities are, ask them how you can best organize support for their struggle. So if you're aware, for example, of the far right trying to influence your local black metal scene, but you yourself are not a part of that scene, you can at least reach out to the people there who are anti-fascist and say, hey, look, uh, I'm, you know, a left activist. I'm not in your scene, but I want to help you in any way that I can. That There's an alliance, okay? Fascists will also target progressive groups. In the recent past, they have engaged in entryism around Palestine solidarity work. Definitely. Um, free Palestine, Israel is a European imperialist, settler, colonial, genocidal apartheid project. But at the same time, there are tons of fascists and anti-Semites who have gotten involved in it on the, quote, paleo-conservative side. That's usually one of the things that they, um, you know, represent themselves as, as like libertarians or paleocons. These people, um, it's usually just a mask for the far right. And so, of course, there are communists, socialists, and just run-of-the-mill progressive reformists who support Palestine against Israel. But fascists try to worm their way in there as well, and you got to push back on that. Opposition to Middle East wars. Uh, criticism. So, uh, well, we'll leave that one alone for now. Criticism of Wall Street and international trade agreements, radical environmentalism, and animal rights. Expose them and push them out. So remember that fundamentally fascism is not just a way to punish and, you know, in some cases even murder um, progressive activists and socialists and unionists and whatever, unionists in the labor union sense. Um, it is as a movement designed to imitate, to mimic the appearance of socialist, you know, revolutionary type movements, but with counter revolutionary content. So some of the aesthetics, some of the rhetoric may be similar, but the fundamental point of it is to be this Trojan horse that, you know, will not just attack activists, but try to subvert the entire movement and cloud what it means to be, quote, against the system. So you, ha you have to understand that, especially libertarians and these other kind of crypto fash things, um, they will, you know, pretend to be like against the system. When you break it down, though, what they're pushing for is literally the same system, but on steroids, like the same system, but even worse. Example, in the Pacific Northwest, eco-fascists have used radical environmentalism to recruit one operation, oper uh, one group, Operation Werewolf, disguises itself as a workout club for men with radical environmentalist views, but it's white nationalist and anti-feminist. Don't tolerate the intolerant. So there's a prime example, actually. So you get this sort of, um, you know, macho group going, and it's actually... Uh, you know, crypto fashion and, and uh, a vehicle for recruiting people to fascism. Bonus round, show your larger political vision. Countering fascism is a necessary but not sufficient part of the larger fight against inequality. It's comparable to leftist lawyers who defend progressive activists. While this is a necessary action with real concrete effects, it will not destroy the pillars of the systemic oppressions that our social and political struggle is based on. Your work as an anti-fascist is part of a larger struggle, not just against white supremacy, but all forms of oppression. In addition to structural racism in policing, work, and housing, this includes attacks on immigrants and refugees, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, homophobia and transphobia, and misogyny. Collaborate with activists fighting these forms of oppression whenever possible. Make it clear you're not just against fascism, but that your actions are part of a larger struggle against hierarchy and oppression. We would say capitalism here as well, probably uh, may have been written from more of an anarchist bent. Um, capitalism, you know, the current phase of class society, the main economic hierarchy, if you will. And in support of equality and freedom, 
for everyone in our society. A couple more screens here. So here's a resource list. This part is organizations and websites which track and analyze the far right. I do have to say on that last screen, um, when this gets rewritten, you put in capitalism because you can't just talk about hierarchy in the abstract. What we're facing is capitalism. So, you know, leaving that out is a glaring omission. Center for Analysis of the Radical Right, Hope Not Hate, Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights, Institute for Research on Male Supremacism, It's Going Down, Idavox, which it's going down, by the way, recently got thrown off of Musk's Twitter, and I don't know if they've been let back on yet. Idavox, or the One People's Project, Montana Human Rights Network, Political Research Associates, Rose City Antifa, Southern Poverty Law Center, the Western States Center, and then books about U.S. fascism in the far right, uh, right-wing populism in America, understanding racist activism, fascism today, control alt delete and insurgent supremacists, alt America, the rise of the radical right in the age of Trump, blood and politics, the history of the white nationalist movement from the margins to the mainstream, proud boys and the white ethno state, how the alt right is warping the American imagination, and the international alt right, fascism for the 21st century. Now, I would add to that, we have a playlist on the channel, which is uh, understanding fascism and far-right socioeconomic political movements. It includes authors like Clara Zetkin, Antonio Gramsci, um, you know, many others. Black Shirts and Reds from Michael Parenti is in that playlist, and a lot of anti-fascist resources, specifically from a communist or Marxist perspective. Finally, other resources, how to organize against militias and patriot movement groups in rural areas. So uh, the Rural Organizing Project has something called Organizing for an Oregon Where Everyone Counts. That's section three of the report, Up in Arms, a guide to the Oregon's Patriot, oh, a guide to Oregon's Patriot Movement. Then on identifying and dealing with fascists, there's one by Kit O'Connell, Beyond the Concrete Milkshake, Tactics for Defeating Media Trolls and Grifters. Mike Isaacson, You Can't Punch Every Nazi, tinyurl.com slash but you can try. And there's a deep platforming project called Sleeping Giants. And then uh, a little bit about the author Spencer Sunshine and Pop Mob or Popular Mobilization. So there you go. Um, and there's all the URLs and things are on the screen there. And we'll put a link to this as well. Let's head over to the chat for a second and uh, just see if people have um, follow up comments or thoughts that we can uh, round this out with and close up you know it's just interesting like thinking back to that little bit of a tiff we got into with somebody last week in the stream when they were like you got you you're having mission creep you, you gotta just talk about capitalism yeah we are I mean these are tools capitalism uses to defend itself so if you actually want to understand capitalism and its effects in the real world you have to look at all these kinds of special oppression all the different forms of bigotry that capitalism uses to divide the working class to get, um, you know, buy-in on their private property project. So where were we? A lot of talk about COVID, which makes sense. We were talking about COVID earlier. I've tuned out of online leftist drama, large uh, waste of time, I've realized. Yeah, I think for me, you know, watching something like Bad Empanada, where he'll do streams that are often fairly on point with regard to particular topics, uh, COVID being a major exception that we did a video on. But I mean, um, you get sort of a sense of what the pseudo left is doing. You know, I mentioned like Maupin and people like that before. And that's one side of it that gravitates towards, um, you know, particular kinds of neo-fascism. But you also have Vosh and all the people who kind of live in the Vosh clout sphere, you know, sort of uh, suckling at the teat of Vosh as far as like online views and stuff go. And um, it is also not left and anti-communist and all that kind of stuff, too, and should be combated because... You know, that kind of rad libery stuff and Jimmy Dore and stuff like that, which is more in that Jackson Hinkle Maupin 
side of things. Vosh is more on the Democratic Party, Radlib, like that side of or that faction of imperialism. But um, yeah, it's worth mentioning like that, that that's a similar uh, topic, but different in its manifestation. It's not neo-fascist in the same way, but it is um, pretending to be anti-fascist in a way that is in fact fascist collaborating. And it needs to be um, dissected as well. But as far as the online leftist drama, it can kind of, you know, watching a little bit of that stuff orient you to who are some of the players in the existing social media space. But yeah, I agree. There's not a lot of value to the content other than sort of getting, um, you know, I didn't really watch a ton of, you know, left YouTube or Twitch streamers or anything like that before I started this channel in 2020, by which I mean almost none. So I wasn't really familiar with all these drama wars and things like that. And I had to get up to speed on them somewhat to do this channel to like, because the people who watch this channel do watch some of those and I had to know what the hell they were talking about when they asked me questions about it. But, um, that said, yeah, I can't say that there's like a ton of really quality content there. So I agree. It's largely a waste of time. And again, you know, real world organizing, um, does just a thousand times more than this. A lot of the people in these spaces have never been a member of a party or anything like that in their life. Just to piggyback, Bray mentions the artifacts in Denmark worked with different types in organizing a blockade from the national base for so long that it caused the multiple types of fascists to create a split in their own rally, which ultimately broke their rally or whatever. Um, yeah. Why do you use the term neo-fascist? Isn't it just fascist? You can say fascist, but there are some differences between post-World War II fascism which we would call neo-fascism and earlier fascism. Um, after fascism was, you know, we want to say defeated in quotes um, in World War II, obviously it just went underground, assumed new forms, and, uh, you know, a lot of ex-Nazis took positions in the West German government or in the NATO government or in the U.S. government, <laughs> etc. So, I mean, fascism... 1.0 was defeated and so neo-fascism generally refers to post-world war ii things where the fascists regrouped and there were new um strains of thought if you will in the movement i mean a lot of the principles are the same but there, there are some differences for one neo-fascism tends to be more internationalist than old fascism was One thing I think is good, Bray notes, is that the right is always trying to say that we infight constantly, but that they are always ready to betray each other. <clears throat> yeah, so um, this was a point we've made before. The right is so full of police informants, and they're constantly snitch jacketing each other, but they're actually, like, there's usually truth to it. Because um, again, they are para police, they're paramilitary. And their ties to law enforcement are very, very real. They, I mean, FBI is all over the, uh, the far right in the U.S. And, you know, they keep them on a leash. It's like, <clears throat> would they, um, it's not just a matter of civil rights or things like that. They can't shut them down entirely because they need them and are sympathetic to them. So, you know, no matter what PR they put out, they exist to serve the same basic purpose that standard law enforcement serves. And anyway, there's tons and tons of overlap. Um, all that really matters at the end of the day to the people bankrolling this stuff is that capitalism stays in place. I mean, that's what it comes down to, you know, anti-communism during the Cold War, uh, which unfortunately they won. And now we're, you know, fighting in the aftermath of that to rebuild the lost communist side but yeah anti uh, anti-communism during the cold war it, it's all tied together with this stuff
Alex Jones has that dude Jay Dyer, who is a Duganist and a Russian Orthodox Christian. His Discord has young teens in it being radicalized or f fascistized, uh, whatever you want to call that. Fascists destroy everything they touch. They can never create anything original. Yeah, it is a movement of co-opting other movements and, and corrupting them for sure. Fascism is corruption more than it is anything else. The swastika is an example of a Hindu religious symbol being appropriated by fascists. Yes, the swastika used to be a general good luck symbol. Um, Hitler took it as... I mean, the Nazis would use some, like, occult logos and, and symbols and signs and things like that. And he had this idea of the eternal return and this sort of, uh, you know, this is part of, like, radical traditionalism and that they were going to sort of break with progress, you know, the fascist thing of um, reject modernity and all that. But anyway, this swastika part, it, I mean, all these things mean more than one thing. But it partly represented to them the idea of the eternal return and um, you know, this sort of anti-modern progress idea. But yeah, it was widely used before that in a way somewhat similar to like a horseshoe is a good luck symbol. But of course much older. What do you think of the definition of fascism as the overt domination of capital? as opposed to its more historic, covert domination. I don't think it's uh, ever been covert. And there are various definitions. For example, like uh, Dimitrov in the comment turn came up with the idea that fascism is the overt um, rule of finance capital. In other words, in imperialism, after the ascendant stage of capitalism, the sort of Wild West stage of capitalism where there's lots of competition between lots of individual firms, capital tends to consolidate over time. And so uh, after that Wild West phase is over and industrial capital gets more and more consolidated, and as it goes to the financial sector for loans to fund its operations, the financial sector gets more consolidated. And at some point, the financial sector becomes so um, intertwined with industrial capital that they kind of swallow it up and become one thing. And this is finance capital, sort of a brief overview. And the idea was that fascism is the overt dominance of finance capital like that particular stage of capitalism and uh, you know you would get some goofy shit like for example um, CPUSA's very goofy vote against fascism campaign uh, that they've been running like every election year the national leadership at least has um, they would use the Dimitrov quote about uh, here let me get the exact quote so vote against fascism and there we go. Call to action. Vote against fascism. There's like a picture of a guy holding a handwritten sign. <clears throat> yeah, this is from September 15, 2020. Call to action. Vote against fascism. Fascism is the power of finance capital itself. Georgi Dimitrov. Hashtag vote against fascism. Well, last I checked, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are soup to nuts just owned by finance capital. Like... This is we're in the most advanced stage of capitalism at this point. It's it's all one. You know, the U.S. government is three defense contractors in a trench coat. It's intimately interconnected between the big banks and industry. And it's 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 all kind of one big imperialist fascist lump at this point. So you can still say that fascism is the most overtly reactionary as a social movement. It's the side or faction that attracts the most overtly reactionary mass movement behind it. Um, in which case, unequivocally, you could point at the Republican Party because the Democrats, um, they don't use that same type of rhetoric to the same extent. And they at least pretend to be, you know, for tolerance and equality and things like that. But of course, within the restrictions of the imperialist police state. Um, but the Republicans, of course, are so, so much, uh, you know, committed to their, um, you know, their ways that they will even call Democrats for, um, 
you know, uh, breaking consensus with them. They'll call them like Marxists or whatever. So yeah, the only thing fascism creates is death. Absolutely. I used to be big into Twitch and YouTube political left streamers, and I just don't get a lot of value out of them other than a few of you guys. Yeah. Um, I would like to see, and I, this is basically the purpose of, of the efforts here at S4A, is to improve the U.S. left, to make it more effectively anti-fascist, to make it more effectively anti-imperialist, understanding what fascism and imperialism are, first of all, um, to make it, you know, all the th I think I was talking about this before. So anyway, that's what I'd like to see. Obviously, if we can organize for revolution, that would be wonderful. As of right now, you know, a lot of, quote, leftists have yet to separate from the Democratic Party. So we have a lot of work to do. And make no mistake, if the U.S. left does not separate out from the Democratic Party, there's no hope of doing anything else. That's an absolute prerequisite. Nazism just migrated to NATO. The official education in Hungary, Ukraine, Poland, etc. is basically fascist propaganda. Yeah, I mean, they'll teach you that the USSR was like basically the root of all evil, etc. Yeah, neo-fascist, pro-imperialist, etc. It's why they will also be mercenaries, see Azov, Wagner Group. The Eternal Return is from Nietzsche originally. Yeah, there were a lot of... Um, Nietzschean philosophical points that were sort of taken into fascism as well. There is a good book about this, The Social and Economic Nature of German Fascism by Alfred Zahn Rattel. He worked in Berlin and saw all the factions of capital trying to use the Nazis, etc., to bring about their breaking of labor unions, etc. It's important to note that paramilitary groups like the Freikorps were, uh, who first wanted the return of the Kaiser, uh, but then they were used to used to become the SS under the uh, Nazis rule. All right, we're going to leave it there for this uh, segment installment in the continuing anti-fascist practical studies here at S4A. And now we're going to start the live stream. Thanks again for listening and make sure to check out live stream number 74.